due to just the fact that every order is on their individual price curve, you don't have this concept of uniform price clearing. You don't have this uh, concept of you know matching people directly um, peer to peer and aggregating demand and supply. And so in a hyper tokenized world with fragmented liquidity, um, I think we will see batch auctions um, you know, play out uh, another advantage over this mechanism. And yeah, it's basically now up to us to, to, to demonstrate and show how, you know, for example, with AMMs, maybe liquidations, really that concept of having one price per token per block um, gives significantly more MEV protection than, um, than just individual Dutch, Dutch, Dutch orders. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Zero X Research. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to give a quick word from our sponsor, Hexens, the most hardcore security team in Web3, pioneering in ZK and novel cryptography. Hex isn't trusted by its tier one protocols such as Polygon, working on their new ZK AVM. We've also got Mantle, Risk Zero, Lido, One Inch, Nubank, and more. You'll hear about them more a little bit later in the show, but be sure to stop by their booth at 832 at Permissionless. And don't forget to mention Zero X Research when you do, so you can get a discounted quote. You'll hear more about them later in the show. But first, as always, we're joined by two BlockWorks Research analysts, Ren and Westy. Not this time to talk about a hot seat cool throne segment, but instead we are going to rift on Friends Tech, the thing everyone is talking about on crypto Twitter. Uh, today is August 21st, um, and we've got a great interview lined up with Felix, the technical lead at CowSwap. Uh, but again, before we jump into the friends.tech talk, uh, I do want to shout out our conference in Austin, Texas. It's permissionless, and it is the world's largest DeFi and crypto native conference, bringing together builders, researchers, investors, and more people in the industry from all around the world into one place. And uh, we would love to see you there. Westy, why don't I kick it over to you to talk about Friends Tech and, and what it's all about? Yeah, absolutely. I've been having a lot of fun this week, but yeah, basically to give an overview, it's a new like social crypto site that allows users to buy and sell shares of associated Twitter accounts or X accounts. And in return, you basically get access to an in-app chat with the user. Um, it's a progressive web app that's designed for users to basically access the site via their mobile device, their iPhone, their Android, et cetera, download it to their homepage. And that's sort of a way to uh, have it feel na like a native mobile experience while actually bypassing a lot of Apple's restrictions when it comes to their app store, uh, cause they're pretty restrictive when it comes to crypto, like even allowing them to be on their app store, um, as well as, you know, taking a cut from uh, potential fees as well. So it sort of bypasses that and it's, yeah, it's taken crypto Twitter by storm. It's onboarded, I think close to a hundred thousand accounts, maybe more than 80,000 at this point. Um, and I think a lot of that is obviously due to teasing an, an airdrop with points based on factors such as invite codes, uh, trading volume, et cetera. And yeah, they're able to onboard a ton of accounts, I think, as the result of onboarding some large CT accounts, which then had them post about their experience, which then on, onboarded their followers and eventually made its way to celebrities like FaZe Banks. And I think people are sort of realizing you know, the power of, of this platform and the fact that they can earn trading fees based on how people trade their shares. And yeah, it's been a crazy experience in the past week. I don't know if I can pass this off to Ren because I know you have a bunch of numbers on, on like how much volume we've seen in the past week. Yeah, so since inception, there's been roughly 32 million in shares bought, 25 million in shares sold. So that equates to a total trading volume of give it 60 million or so. The total value of all profiles is 21 million with the top 10 profiles being worth 4.1 million. Uh, the top profile right now is Racer, which is the creator of Friends.Tech. His portfolio is worth a cool 777,000, although he's not the highest earner. So there's probably been less trading happening on his shares. But yeah, it's been a wildly profitable and wildly successful protocol so far has managed to generate 2.8 million in protocol fees, apparently 56.8 million in protocol inflow. And if I had to guess, that's probably around 25 to 30% of basis total TVL. So it's definitely like a significant contributor to base. And there's been 1.44 million in cumulative transactions. I don't know how much of those cumulative transactions are bots. I would guess a 
decent amount considering every large account gets spotted or mev immediately upon signing up but definitely still respectable numbers nonetheless and from a cash flow perspective like a lot of people mostly large accounts have been completely raking kobe has made one hundred and forty-two thousand. Asuka has made 98,000, Racer almost 100,000, Suju himself has made roughly 60,000. Maybe you can pay off some of those 3AC creditors with that. Um, but yeah, uh, all things considered, it's been a crazy one week. I think it remains to be seen whether this sustains. I think a lot of crypto natives are betting on non-crypto individuals to come on, whether that's sports stars, gaming stars your models or your favorite only fans creator whoever um but yeah exciting times yeah it's really interesting that we've seen this so far and the the way that the accounts earn fees is kind of interesting to me so there's like a you know you're buying and selling shares of an account uh which don't really give you like ownership of an account in any meaningful capacity they just give you like this gated access to a really shitty private chat um but it's it's interesting that so like obviously there's trading volume that goes on with those transactions and then there's i think a 10 percent fee in total half goes to the protocol itself all the other half so five percent each uh goes to the actual account so that's like how these fees actually get generated for the user so it is kind of interesting that there is like some profit mechanism uh for the creator themselves you know i think this is like directionally correct um i kind of my framework for this right now is this is like a great proof of concept but largely like we'll need to be heavily iterated uh iterated on and what i'm battling with is like okay if this is really some like perfect be all end all solution why not just integrate this into twitter form or x formerly twitter um and like i could see them going this route now like every time i've mentioned that to someone or tweeted about it the immediate response is like, oh, these are unregistered securities. And like, I just think that is such a middle of the curve take. Like, like I don't know. I, I just don't see this getting regulated. Like it's a, a stock of illegal ownership to the cash flows of a business. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. It is a weird gray area for sure. Because I could see why someone could look at that, like trading shares of an account. It kind of looks like a security, but I think you're right in that like, the way it's actually set up, obviously I'm not a lawyer, but just the way that I see it is that if it's based on trading fees of the shares and not on the actual individual output of that creator, then I think it's completely fine. But what do I know? Definitely a bad name. Like I, th I think you're just inviting unwanted uh, attention by, by naming them shares. But like this is even if you just like maybe you know you can probably draw lines to how it does look like a, a true share of a, of a business but that's just like objectively not what not what's happening here like i don't know this is just not trying to buy ownership in the future cash flows of a person it's just like buying a you know a community pass to that person uh which goes to like the you know you gotta let's dissect like what you actually get by buying a share in someone today and uh, if you buy a share of an account you just get like i said there's still like a, a private a private chat sort of thing where it's like sort of like dming except you know if you have multiple people that own shares you can ask the the one person let's say like everyone here has a share of westy we can all ask westy a question in this chat but sam you can't see my questions and i can't see your questions but westy can see them both and we can both see westy's responses it's like i don't even know if that's intentional i think that's just like it's just a broken product right now and like you know i get it launch an mvp get to market try to guild build up some hype uh see if there's even any level of product market fit and then iterate on it which that's probably the best way to get a product out the door um but in my opinion like if they don't start trying to fix this app they're going to kind of miss their their window of opportunity um when like you know i'm, I'm trying to want to love this thing but like every time i open the app it just something's wrong and it's a different thing every time and i'm like all right like what, what are we doing here I agree with uh, going back to Dan's point about it being directionally correct. However, I do think that's sort of like two different subset of users, right? There's one subset, which is kind of creators, right? Um, the people who are probably using Patreon today, YouTube people, um, Twitch streamers, maybe. And then the other subset is influencers. I feel like an app like friends.tech especially with its sort of pricing curve is much more suited for 
influencers, right? There, there, there's a lot of people that are out there right now basically saying, oh, yeah, why wouldn't like a OnlyFans creator come onto Friends.Tech and they can rake in a huge amount of trading fees. But to me, I don't think that's their business model. Like their, their business model is dependent on the constant cash flows that they're able to generate from like an OnlyFans subscriber, right? Um, and that's kind of what they're banking on. Whereas if they move over, you're banking on trading volume, which I don't think will always be able to sustain, especially for a prolonged period of time. And once that fizzles out, you're just going to be left with like no value as a creator there. Uh, however, I think the alternative side of this coin is for influencers, right? They sort of thrive and evolve that attention. People want to like collect the cloud. People want to belong like whoever next, the next biggest like superstar is. Like imagine if you got like a up and coming actor like early on. And I don't know. I do think like there's definitely some interesting, I don't know if integrations is the right word, but like real world privileges, you know, like if you buy a share of Brad Pitt, you get to meet him for like the next uh, film, like red carpet, you know, or you get to walk the red carpet with him or like something silly like that. But yeah, I, I think the difference between creators and influencers, like is pretty apparent for me and their sort of use case for Fence.Tech. I do think it'll be interesting to see how like shares or like the value of shares respond to like real world events. I don't know. For example, imagine like if Will Smith was on this app, right? And then we replayed the Oscar last year where he slapped Chris Rock on stage. And I don't know, it would be hilarious seeing everyone dump his shares for one hour straight. I think that'd be pretty funny. Um, but yeah, I, I am really looking forward to what the next wave of users that are onboarded onto Friends.Tech is going to look like. And I think that would be fairly telling, to be honest, of how sustainable this app will be. I want to see the, I think they've actually done a pretty good job of this is trying to abstract away the fact that ETH is like even uh, a number on your screen. Like the value of other people's shares is denominated on the home screen in dollars. Um, there's like, the, honestly, the only way you really see ETH is like on your own wallet in like the home tab or something like that, or your profile tab. Uh, but I, I want to see them take that a step further. Like if you really want your everyday Joe to, to log in and start buying their friends and you know, socializing on this app. I think you got to like completely remove the ETH nominations away from it. Um, and I even, I tested something like this on my friends. I was like, yo, like, what do you guys think? Completely normal, like non-crypto friends. I was like, what do you guys think about this? And they were all like, what the hell? Like <laughs> they had zero interest. So I also think crypto Twitter is like, oh, this is our consumer app. This is our breakup moment. Buckle up. I'm like, all right. Like most people probably don't want to financialize Twitter to be completely honest. The funny thing is I've actually heard the opposite argument that instead of denominating in dollars, we should denominate in ETH because when you think back to NFTs, a lot of people were able to just shell out thousands of dollars because, oh, it was one ETH or a couple of ETH where it didn't look like you're really okay. shelling out all that much, but in US dollars terms, you actually were. And if people actually saw the amount that they were spending, they wouldn't spend as much. So there is sort of that two-sided sword to that. I would also echo Dan there a little in terms of the echo chamber on Twitter. Um, I'm not entirely sure this is a new paradigm yet. I know there's been like probably 100,000 active addresses, but if you look at the profiles of the most number of shares held or the most number of holders, like that's Kobe and he has 157 holders. <laughs> that's like 0.0000001% of the human population. Like even if that number was 1000 i wouldn't think that's like very impressive in the grand scheme of like a consumer app maybe if that number was like 10,000, i'll be like okay yeah this thing has legs but 157 is nowhere close to like sort of the first actual consumer app in crypto that's going to be widely adopted i mean to me i think the issue with with that number specifically is the the bonding curve that they used and the fact that you have to buy a full share of someone's account in order to have access. Whereas if they had some sort of like smooth bonding curve, you could have like fractional ownership over these shares. And I think you are you would see a lot more holders of something like Kobe or like the top accounts where it costs what, like two ETH to buy a share, which most people aren't gonna throw out to a new application, right? But if you could buy, you know, 0.1 ETH of Kobe, I'm sure a lot of people would do that, right? So I think that's one step. 
But to me, like, I think this is a worthwhile experiment as a whole. Like, yes, I, I definitely don't think it's the end state, but I think there's like two key things when it comes to like creating a new social network that crypto allows to do a lot better. And I think we're sort of seeing inklings of this. I think one is like bootstrapping a new user base. That's like the biggest issue with new social networks is how do you get like the, your first user base that loves the product and gets other people on board? And using crypto, using like a token airdrop in this case, using, you know, a community within CT that loves to try out new products, like you automatically have an easy bootstrapping mechanism for your social network. And then you also have like a second big property, which is sort of uh, an addictive nature to the application, which we can debate whether that's like a good thing for the users or for society. But I think it's pretty self-explanatory that the, the apps that people use the most are the most addictive and in the same way that how on like Instagram, how likes and how retweets, how they like sort of hit your, your dopaminergic system. You can think of like speculation and the fact that your account is associated, like it's price goes up and down like that is really addictive to users. And so I think using crypto in both those ways allow it to, you know, flourish as social apps. And so while this is not the end state, I think it shows, what could be possible. And I think people are going to take this and iterate on it. No, I'm definitely not Googling dopaminergic right now. I think the next logical step here is someone creates a protocol that issues zero day to expiry options on fence stock that shares, and then we run back turbo. Speaking briefly on like derivatives, there have been derivatives that have been popping up around fence stock tech. The two major ones are AVO and Hyperliquid. Both of them have released Friends Perps, which represents the total market cap of all of the profiles on Friends.Tech. It hasn't been a huge amount of volume. On AVO, the 24-hour volume is 470,000. On Hyperliquid, the 24-hour volume is 3.6 million. Uh, one has an open interest of 80,000. Hyperliquid has an open interest of 1.1 million. But the demand to long is definitely there. AVO has a one hour funding rate of 1.62%, which equates to 14,000% annualized. Um, same thing for Hyperliquid. They have an annualized funding rate of 5,600%. So you are paying a hefty, hefty amount to go along right now. However, I, I do think that it makes sense. Like, I, I feel like Friends.Tech will probably keep going for a bit more as long as people write the narrative of whatever like target audience they think is gonna come and onboard into friends.tech so we'll see it, it seems like a relatively asymmetric trade like it seems like a trade similar to if someone made a perp on like stablecoin market cap that should be like a no-brainer long over the long term it kind of feels like that um but yeah i'll pass it to someone else to talk about you know fractionalization bonding curves and where it might go from here I actually, I think you need this super steep bonding curve at, to kickstart things, right? Because if Kobe was trading at like $10 or something, this would have never gone anywhere. And, and you kind of need those like original big set of big numbers to like draw eyeballs and get that initial wave of attention. Mind you, I definitely think you need to make it affordable for like nobody's buying. I don't know, not nobody, but you know, throwing $2,000 at this just to start playing is obviously not that uh, lucrative or, or engaging to most people. Uh, so if you truly want a consumer app, it just like needs the affordable entry barrier. But that's been a notorious problem for almost every crypto game. Uh, and I don't really know how to solve it because let's say you like either do fractional shares or, you know, you just flatten the curve extremely, then that doesn't like price out whales because they just buy a larger number of, of the underlying uh, the units. So it's still kind of hard to figure out a way where you can actually keep it affordable for new people to come in because, you know, let's say it only took 150 shares to hit two ETH in the current uh, bonding AMM or the, the bonding curve. Well, let's say you made that. So it took a hundred thousand shares to get to two ETH. Like if someone wanted to buy that much, they still could. So, um, I don't know. I don't really know if there's a great solution there, but I, that's definitely one issue that I think we need to keep kind of hacking away and solving it. If you fractionalize the shares, then, you know, wouldn't that person, the creator have to be like super, super attentive to every single shareholder or like, I don't mm -hmm. even get what the argument is here. To me, the value of it is like 
being within a group of 100 people who can hit up Grace and Alan to like have a conversation. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like the value proposition at that point is completely ruined. I mean, most people are going to be buying in fractionally to get exposure to the price. They're not actually getting in a group chat. So I think in order to do it, I think that's a great point, though, and that if you were to fractionalize it, like you'd need to have a full share at least to have access to the chat or whatever. Um, So it allows for there to be a pricing of one share, which prices you into a chat while also being able to buy like a fraction to get exposure to the price. Yeah, this also doesn't feel that different from stock splits in TradFi. You know, like most big tech companies, once the stock reaches a certain like ridiculous number, like a thousand dollars, they'll do like a six to one or like one to six stock split. Uh, like Apple, Disney, all of the big companies have done that. Um, but I, I do like the idea of like sure you can fractionalize it. That makes it a lot easier for new participants to come in and buy shares, but you still need to retain a certain amount in order to interact with the profile and i feel like there's actually a pretty good amount of customization that friends tech could do there like letting the creator or like the person choose what that number is whether that's like 0.1 eve if you're like not as big you're like a casual twist streamer or like 10 shares if you're like a superstar yeah no that i think that makes sense to me um i think there's one also one narrative that kind of got misconstrued pretty quickly which was uh just the fact that somebody i think it was like bantag or whatever put like scraped a github uh and put together a list of like twitter account names linked with the uh, funding address (laughs) that got picked up by a news media outlet and like circulated as oh there was a data privacy breach or something along these lines and uh, that is just not what happened here. And like honestly, people that were taking the side uh, of like, oh, this is like a doxing, like, what are you doing? Like, you're kind of just exposing yourself for not really knowing uh, how a transparent ledger blockchain works. So uh, be- if you fund an address with a different wallet, that is a transaction that appears on the blockchain and that anybody can query uh, at any point in time. And there is forever into perpetuity as long as it's there's one ethereum node running evidence of this transaction um so it's not a it shouldn't come as a, too big of a surprise to anybody in the space that yes when you fund an address with another wallet people will find who that previous wallet was um so not totally surprising but for some reason that that did come up as a as a narrative but nonetheless i think there's actually two winners here uh ethereum itself and coinbase so ethereum itself is a little bit obvious but I know this was people using Ethereum as money. And even if you're denominating it in dollars, at the end of the day, the transactional asset is still ETH. Uh, And this is, again, just putting another leg on the pedestal of the ETH is money narrative. And that's probably why ETH has the value that it has. It doesn't have to do anything with the profitability of its block space um, or things of that nature. There's no DCF to run, as John Charb likes to point out. It, ETH is a, is be gradually becoming native internet money, and that's there's a market for that. Um, and then Coinbase as well. This all, all this activity is happening on Base, their new L2, and I think that's just kind of got to get them excited. If you're seeing this, and you know, you're, I think they're what two uh, less than a month, maybe three weeks into on chain summer and the the release of this protocol. Um, they gotta be, gotta be fired up to see this level of activity and being a consumer based app, right? Because eventually you got to think Coinbase doesn't want to expand into more crypto natives, but, uh, beyond that as well. Uh, and actually right before this, uh, podcast, I, I saw that Coinbase just announced a minority stake in circle, uh, and they're going to be launching USDC on six additional chains. Uh, you'd have to imagine that's noble and base will be getting native USDC. Uh, so expanding the Coinbase empire onto base and bringing more cash flows through those uh, reserve asset yields. So pretty exciting for both Ethereum and, and Coinbase. Yeah, to add to your base optimism, that's kind of a pun I didn't mean to do, but there you go. Um, I saw that uh, base actually surpassed Arbitrum and optimism in daily transactions just before we hopped on this call, which is obviously I think like a, a third to half of that transaction activity is friends.tech. And I find it kind of ironic because they're doing this like on-chain summer promotional movement. And I don't think Friends Tech was a part of that partnership. Correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of cool to see like a grassroots project actually take off like this for sure. 
Yeah, just to add on to the data side of things, um, Tom Wan from 21 Shares pointed out a pretty interesting metric. Uh, Arbitrum currently has a ETH penetration rate of 1.85% in terms of addresses. That number is 1.15 for Optimism. That number is 0.25% for Base. Um, but if you look at how long it took each of these chains, each of these chains to reach a 0.25% penetration, it took Arbitrum nine months. It took Optimism eight months, and it took Base one month. And I would argue market conditions are probably worse right now than when Arbitrum and Optimism first launched. So it's pretty interesting to see these metrics. Is that metric the percentage of all Ethereum addresses that have transacted on the L2? Yeah, number of addresses on Ethereum that have transacted on the L2s, yeah. That's a cool stat. Tom Wan, the GOAT. I think it's also important to note that in Q3, Base has had 25% higher profit than Arbitrum, which has had, I think, like 5% more profit than Optimism. Um, so, and that's mostly a result of uh, low L1 costs uh, in comparison to these other rollups. And I think in the past couple of days, they've actually surpassed the, the revenues, like the transaction fees from Arbitrum and Optimism by like a large magnitude. So definitely gaining a lot of adoption and reaping the rewards. Just a quick note to go back to uh, Dan's point on privacy just now. I do think I have some slight privacy concerns with friends.tech concerning the fact, you know, you need to put in your phone number to receive that 2FA code. That that feels like a pretty big attack vector, especially if they're keeping these phone numbers and linking it to your profile. Um, Sim solves are pretty common these days. And the other thing is that it can tweet and comment from your Twitter account, right? Um, I feel like there's potential for some really bad things to happen there. If, for example, like the friends tech database or whatever server they use gets hacked, you know, and suddenly you have every single one of the largest Twitter accounts and you have access to their accounts and you can tweet from them. Like you could cause some pretty serious carnage there. So I, I would just be wary there. Yeah, that's a good flag, Ren. And you can actually revoke uh, the Twitter permissions from friends tech and still use the app totally fine. So I, yeah, definitely would good call out there and would recommend everyone doing that. Also, we didn't share any details earlier on the, the airdrop, but basically it's a hundred million points that they say are gonna be useful for something in the future. And they're gonna be distributed every Friday with the snapshot taken at Thursday at 11.59 PM UTC. And like they're changing the criteria every single week so it can't be gamed as easily. And they're trying to encourage people to just use the platform as you should. Um, but again, I think this is a great testament to kind of taking a page from the the blur playbook a little bit, like incentivizing user behavior, honestly, trying to get people to like break shit, to be quite frankly. And it's crypto native people. So we're like used to terrible UX. So maybe the argument and strategy here is they really just wanted to onboard us because we knew they knew we'd be super engaged and really good product testers. And, you know, they're kind of getting the the application ready for for like mainstream usage in six months once the airdrop actually concludes. So kind of an interesting strategy. You know, we're seeing people change up their airdrop formulas quite a bit since since Blur did their kind of novel mechanism a while back. It's going back to another point in terms of winners. I think one of the largest winners are the MEV bots. Um, these bots have been sniping profile launches whenever like someone signs up. So how it works is a Twitter user signs up and then as soon as that account is created and funded, uh, the MEV bot recognizes that and comes in before anyone else to buy. And then after like a lot of people come in and buy, cause it's a big account, it dumps on those buyers. Um, looking at AX ASXN right now, the largest trader by PNL is a sniping bot and he's generated 260. If in profits since launch. So this guy is eating a lot. Um, and then, yeah, apparently there was sort of like a quirk in basis sequencer that allowed this MEV bot to get the same block inclusion on new shares listed. And apparently what happened is that the RPC provider for friend.tech was accidentally sharing their entire transaction pool or their mempool. So you could pretty easily back when anyone else's new accounts and their shares in the same block they were created before anyone else. 
Yeah, that's going to have to get cleaned up for this to scale as well. Like, <laughs> it just feels like this dumb thing we have to deal with. But uh, I think it was maybe Fubar who tweeted this, and they had a pretty decent way to at least patch some of it to some degree. Is like maybe for the first hour, first X time window, uh, while right, right after the account is created, like only active Twitter followers can purchase the shares or something of that nature. Uh, but definitely need to get some guardrails in place to prevent the botting of this for sure. That's probably a good place to hang up the cleats and uh, move on to our interview again. We have a great, great, great interview with with Felix from CowSwap today, diving into the technical analysis of how that protocol works. So uh, without further ado, let's dive right in. All right, everyone, we are joined today by Felix, the technical lead at Cow Protocol to jam on all things Cow Protocol, CowSwap, MEV Blocker, uh, and, and the likes of the MEV, the Dark Forest itself. Uh, so Felix, thanks a ton for joining us. You know, we tend to have a podcast that's like geared towards people that aren't aren't necessarily beginners. It doesn't tend to be beginner friendly, but given the the subsector of crypto that you guys are uh, operating within, I do want to ask the question I hate the most of like, can you quickly give us a, a like just a high level overview of what the what coincidence of wants really are, uh, and what the cow protocol is, and how that kind of fits into cow swap itself. The question was, what are coincidence of wants? Um, basically, a coincidence of want is an economic phenomenon where one party would like to uh, purchase an asset um, that another party wants to sell, uh, and the other party wants to buy another asset that the first party wants to sell. So we basically have this like coincidence of of people wanting the exact opposite of one another. Um, and the nice thing about this um, case is that uh, those people can then um, trade directly with one another peer to peer rather than going through um, either a medium of exchange such as such as money, where maybe I sell my stuff for for dollars and then go to another store and buy the other thing for dollars or um, in the crypto space also, um, you know, liquidity providers, AMMs, uh, anyone, market makers that basically um, always provide a, a price for a good A um and of course take take some fee or some 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 spread for for that service and um how that ties into crypto or how that ties into to decentralized exchange uh, exchanges in, in general is that um i would say maybe not the the primary um selling point of cow which i would say is, is mev protection but um one extra efficiency gain over some of the other solutions that are out there that are also trying to prevent um or mitigate mev is that um you know, uh, on Ethereum, basically, it becomes extremely um, cheap to create assets, to create tokens. Um, you might have, you know, your own project token, or even the US dollar has been tokenized uh, many, many, um, many, many times, uh, different tokens representing the exact same real world asset. And so this kind of Cambrian explosion of, of token space makes the liquidity, the liquidity or the market in general, very, very fragmented. Um, so instead of having, you know, like in the traditional stock market where all your stocks are denominated in USD, you um, on Ethereum have some markets that are primarily um, denominated in ETH, maybe some others in USDC, maybe some others in USDT, there is no common numerator. And so you have this like explosion of different markets. Um, and in order to create liquidity between all different token pairs, you need these market makers that step in or AMMs that step in and provide this liquidity. However, if you can take a holistic approach and let's say, you know, once per block get the entire, um, I guess, you know, preference expression of, of the world, uh, I would like to buy this for that, I would like to buy this for that. Uh, what you can actually do, you can aggregate, re-aggregate that, that fragmented liquidity space and find those coincidence of ones. Um, so let's say um, I want to buy, you know, some euro stable coin for a dollar stable coin and Sam wants to um, buy some, you know, Bitcoin, web Bitcoin for for the dollar stable coin, and, and maybe then you want to buy um, the euro stable coin with with web Bitcoin. Then, you know, even though there is no, you know, we, we in in the traditional world right now we would have to go to an AMM and then each of us do that trade individually. But um, in a per perfect coincidence of world or barter economy, or it's also sometimes called, is uh, we can actually um, trade peer to peer directly with one another. And and um, in that case, we. Uh, save, of course, the the spread that the market maker uh, charges. We save um, also on gas fees uh, for updating uh, the AMMs uh, three times. Uh, and then most importantly, uh, we also uh, don't fall back to some of the other drawbacks that AMMs have, namely um, maximal extractable value, MEV, uh, and, and basically uh, the, the problem of setting the correct slippage and not getting front run or sandwiched by these um, nanobots, how, how, how they are called. 
Okay, yeah, and I feel like what ties closely to that is uh, the concept of batch auctions and cow swap. Can you kind of explain how those work and maybe it'd be helpful to walk through, you know, what a traditional transaction looks like for a trader on Uniswap versus someone using cow swap? Yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, and, and maybe I'll talk about Uniswap, the, the traditional uh, version, not, not necessarily Uniswap X, uh, which has been recently announced. We can then also go a little bit into more um, detail on like what is the difference between those two models. But traditionally, if you want to trade token A for token B on Ethereum, you um, go directly to an AMM uh, interface or um, maybe to a DEX aggregator such as Paraswap 1inch, uh, for example. And um, say I wanted to sell token A for token B and then the, the the algorithm will find you the best on-chain route for your trade um, and will basically give you back a transaction that you with your MetaMask account will submit to, to the blockchain to execute that trade. Now, there is this asynchronous aspect to you receiving the optimal route from whatever API you're using and you actually sending that transaction into the mempool and then that transaction getting mined. Um, and during that time, prices can change, and and um, because of that, you know, either you are willing to, um, you know, if your route is no longer available, you might be willing to take that that failed transaction cost and 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 eat the loss and basically try again, or you're actually saying, well, I'm fine if the price moves 0.5% against me, I still want to make this trade. But the key part is you commit to a specific route, um, a specific execution path, and you own the trade execution. Now on CalSwap. Um, what you do is you simply sign a trade intent, an off-chain message that says, I want to sell token A for token B, and here's my limit price, but I don't care exactly how it is executed. I don't care if you route it through Uniswap or through Balancer or through SushiSwap. Um, just, you know, my intent is trade token A for token B. And then you hand off that intent to a um, decentralized network of matching engines, or how we call them solvers, that compete for finding the best concrete execution path for you at the time that um, you know your order is being made valid and, and to the point of batch auctions um, you know one thing to create these coincidence of once um, we basically don't have everybody trade individually by themselves but we aggregate you know for now um, every 30 seconds roughly um, trades are being you know, all the trades that are placed into the API within a 30 second window roughly are, are um, placed into the same batch down, you know, longer term down, long, down, down the line, we want to have one batch per block. So, you know, um, everything that happened in the last 12 seconds before the last block was after the last block was emitted, uh, basically becomes available for solvers to compete for in the batch option for the next block. Um, and yeah, so solvers basically find a solution to that um, batch of, of orders and the solver that is able to solve the batch optimally and we can talk a little bit about uh, how optimality is, is derived um, but basically it's price improvement on your limit price receives the right to execute the batch um, and also the you know that privilege also comes with the responsibility of executing the batch so that solver that won the off-chain competition has committed to a price that it is able to um, give to the user um, on chain. And so everything comes to slippage uh, tolerance, comes to um, you know re revert costs, all these kind of risks, these complexities of managing your own transaction are now taken care of by a professional entity who um, you know, is much more like a you know, MEV bot or searcher, uh, capable of foreseeing price changes, capable of knowing you know, maybe what's happening on Binance at the same time. And, and so can you know, take care of these complexities much better than the average user can. Now this is getting fun because there's a lot to unpack here. So uh, you mentioned that, you know, you're working, solvers are working to create or to like define optimal, like how is uh, the optimal solution defined here? Because that's ultimately what determines which swaps will get filled. So let's, let's dive a little deeper there. Like how can you, uh, what conditions need to be met that are create this optimal, uh, the optimal batch? Yeah. So um, basically what users place in the, in the, uh, in the batch auction are just plain old limit orders. And so a limit order has a, a limit price. And so that limit price is a hard guarantee that is enforced by the settlement contract. Um, I, you know, the, the system is not able to match your trade at a price that is worse, worse than your limit price. And that's kind of similar to when you trade on Uniswap directly and you set a slippage tolerance and then an MEV bot sandwiches you and basically um, exhausts your slippage tolerance and you get um, traded exactly at your, at your limit price. Now, the, the thing on top, the price improvement on top of your limit price is what we call surplus. And um, surplus is basically what, what solvers optimize for. Um, and so uh, if I am a malicious or, you know, somewhat, you know, ex 
value extracting solver and I want to uh, settle you at the limit price, okay, I can submit a, a proposal for this batch that, that settles you at your limit price. But another solver that um, proposes a solution with price improvement will automatically um, score higher in the ranking criteria than the initial solver. And the protocol will basically grant the right to execute the, the batch eventually to the highest bidding um, solver. And so that off-chain competition ensures that your limit price is uh, not just kind of a worst price guarantee, but it's also something that you know then has this incentive to be approved upon and, and whatever party improves upon the most gets the right to fill you. And so how is the so like this sounds a lot like the traditional mev boost auction right where builders are working to solve uh, transactions for the proposers um and so what is the incentive for these solvers in this case like are they taking a portion of the surplus um yeah so i think you know one, one thing that's actually interesting when, when we compare the system to mev boost is um so so maybe one thing that i actually didn't mention about batch auctions is that um if there's two people trading the same asset in the same batch, so let's say I'm selling Ether for UCC and Dan, you're selling Ether for UCC, then the protocol enforces that there is only one price per token per batch. So if we end up in the same batch, we get cleared and we, we trade the same asset, we get cleared at exactly the same price. There's no concept of maybe you placed your order before mine or you know, you know, there's no concept of first come, first served or some kind of ordering, fair ordering. There's just you know, uniform price clearing, one price per token per batch. And um, kind of what that achieves is it, at least in our mind, removes um, all kinds of MEV. Because if you think about uh, what is the highest paying block in MEV boost or what is kind of what, what are the things that, that um, currently builders and searchers um, optimize for is to create as much price difference as possible for the same asset within the same block, because that ultimately allows the searcher or builder to buy the asset at the lowest price and sell it at the highest price and basically therefore make this risk-free, um, you know, intra-block um, profit. And so in a way, searchers and solvers actually solve a somewhat similar problem, but the outcome is actually completely the opposite. If you're really good at solving the, um, the MEV boost or the PBS problem, you will, you'll create blocks where um, you're for the same asset, you'll have prices, you know, diverging one, two, three percent as much as you can. Whereas on CowSwap, if there's two people trading the same asset, you actually need to have a uniform price clearing. So no, no difference between, between, between buy and asks. And so, yes, while the optimization problem is somewhat similar, the outcome is actually completely the opposite. And it leads to the fact that um, unsophisticated users that don't know how to maybe, you know, boost their way and, and get priority over others' um, transactions in this pseudo first come first served um, mechanism that is currently the public mempool, which you know, of course is not first come first served uh, because you can just you know, outbid other people. Uh, but the least, you know, very, very few people actually know how to do this, this properly. And so the, the cow swap mechanism allows, allows you to um, be protected uh, despite, you know, and, and not having to worry about all these games that are being played in the dark forest in the, in the, in the mempool right now. Interesting. Yeah, I like that comparison that you made there, Dan, with MevBoost, but it's ironic that you get exactly the opposite outcome, like you mentioned, Felix. But so it sounds like you need a very competitive solver market in order for this to probably work at its best. So how does that look today? Is it permissionless to join the solver network? Like what kind of expertise do you need? Yeah. So, um, and actually, Dan, I, I didn't answer your question. What are the incentives for the solvers, right? Um, and so in its very purest form, the mechanism allows solvers to take a cut from the, uh, you know, optimal route that they find. And, and basically they just compete on who takes the lowest cut in the end. Um, so, you know, if I were a private market maker and I can buy Ether on Binance for, uh, for $1,900, then maybe I sell it to you for $1,901 and, and make $1 profit. And as long as no other solver sells it for $1,900 to you, then I win and I can make this profit. So there is like this aspect of, you know, potentially and in its purest form, a race to the bottom, but it is specifically to bootstrap the solver network and solver competition. And, you know, now maybe with one inch uh, fusion and Uniswap X, uh, a lot more participants are moving into the space. But when we came out two years ago, we really had to like think about, okay, there's this chicken and egg problem. How do we bootstrap that decentralized network of matching engines um, is basically what we, what, what the, the cow protocol token was, um, was, was partially used for. Um, we created this competition with a reward and um, basically solvers receive um, cow tokens for um, yeah, performing the task of, of um, finding the best uh, solution. And yeah, we've bootstrapped a network of, I think today we are 15, 16 solvers. 
um, which is which is quite quite good. Um, and you know now of course with other participants entering the space, we also are thinking about maybe this mechanism needs to be changed or, or revisited or maybe even reversed. Maybe there's even you know the the non toxicity of the flow that Cowsop attracts might make it actually worthwhile for solvers to pay the protocol. Um, for getting access to that order flow rather than being paid by the protocol or you know maybe some hybrid mechanism similar to EIP 1559 where in uh, times of high demand ethereum is def deflationary and in um, times of low demand it's it's inflationary uh, so yeah we, we were still working on the tokenomics there but um, roughly that is that is the idea on how to um, yeah develop that that network on how we bootstrapped it in the, in the first place Okay, super interesting. And I'm curious, like in your mind, what makes like uh the what what type of candidate is like an excellent person or, or entity to come be a solver? Is it somebody with like maybe a ton of order flows so to say a DEX aggregator that didn't want to like get into this game? You, you mentioned Uniswap X and uh one inch fusion are kind of pushing this direction. But if there was another DEX aggregator, like, hey, like look, maybe we just go run a solver on CowSwap, like would that be beneficial if they're coming with this order flow? Yeah, we actually had a, um, a solver team which had a very good algorithm to um, yeah, solve the optimal routing problem for um, all types of, of um, convex liquidity on, on Ethereum. And um, they were thinking about creating a DEX aggregator or becoming a solver. And basically, the advantage is you don't have to worry about the end user and user experience and building a product, a front end, which is a very different job, actually, to being a very efficient um, routing or matching engine. And um, so that team, you know, tapped into Cow Protocol, became a solver, um, and and basically received uh, a lot of volume from from day one, and and you know is, is basically now expanding to of course other other protocols as well. But yeah, was was basically able to to create a fully working um, product and business without having to worry about the um, the end user and and product experience and user experience. And so if you ask me, kind of what is the the qualities you need? I would say, you know, we're, we're still figuring out kind of how to make the most of the complementaries um, of, of the different skill sets that are needed. And right now, I would say you need you need kind of three three skill sets. Um, one is uh, an excellent knowledge of on-chain liquidity, so a way to model all the different uh, liquidity sources on chain. May it be Curve, may it be Uniswap, may it be whatever next AMM comes out in the next couple of months, and be fast at integrating those and routing optimally through the on-chain liquidity. Uh, you also should have at least some connections or maybe even be a market maker yourself to um, access off-chain liquidity and you know, uh, centralized exchange liquidity, maybe liquidity from other chains like layer two so that you can bridge liquidity into that um, into that batch auction that you can source from, from other venues in order to be competitive. And then at the end of the day, you also should be quite knowledgeable about the, um, yeah, well, transaction lifecycle and, and um, basically how to make sure that uh, you set your slippage tolerance uh, correctly, maybe predict what will be the price impact on the top pools given the action that you see in the real world in the last five, six, seven seconds. Um, so having kind of that predictive uh, knowledge so that you don't get your slippage tolerance exhausted and then basically yourself front run by, by um, other bots in the system um, is quite is quite important. Um, so, so what we've seen in the past is actually, you know, searchers or um, uh, participants that run that run uh, searcher bot operations um, also do quite well in in running solvers. Um, yeah, because the skill set is quite uh, quite similar. Okay, that makes that makes a ton of sense here. And so I'm curious if I'm a solver and I create the solved route for a specific batch, do I have the ability to include my own transactions in that batch? Because I could see a world where you could, you know, create this uh, solved path and then maybe there's like a background potential there. Um, so you can include your own liquidity into your solutions. Yes, um, private liquidity from the solver. However, those orders don't count as you know, native Cowswap orders. So they, they will not contribute to the optimization um, criterion. So if you are sending an order on your behalf into your solution, it doesn't count towards the, the surplus that is being uh, computed. And basically, the assumption is that only orders that every solver has seen, and for that, you know, the system also relies on some uh, data availability guarantees. Basically, we need to have a canonical view of what is the batch, and only the orders that are in the batch visible to everyone um, do contribute in the end to to that surplus to the optimization criterion. So you can improve prices, but you have to improve the prices, you know, for the user. If you improve prices for yourself, it doesn't really um, make a difference in the competition. 
Okay, that seems like a good protection mechanism. And then you also earlier mentioned that currently the batches are running every 30 seconds or so, uh, but you want to try to trend that down towards every block. What's the barrier there? Like, how do you get from the current state to that end state? Um, a lot of it is <laughs> a lot of it is actually technical depth in our in our uh, infrastructure just right now. Um, the way that you know the solvers have evolved from the very early days where um, we implemented a bunch of you know baseline um, you know dex aggregator solver and, and then gnosis uh, once we spun out of gnosis gnosis continued to to run those um, has just you know caused a bunch of uh, overhead in, in when it comes to assembling the auction. And, and in the beginning, we always thought like 30 seconds is actually fine because we want to increase the chances for these coincidence of ones. The longer we wait, um, the more likelihood there are of multiple orders ending up in the same batch and thus um, getting these like positive network effects. But we um, reason, I mean, we realized pretty quickly that, that users are actually, you know, at, at least they want to have the choice. They're quite, they're quite annoyed by the, the time that cost of takes um, for them to uh, have the happy moose sound to basically get their order um, traded. And, and so we definitely want to move down to a one batch per block uh, model and then potentially have order types where the user can say, you know, please don't match me against on-chain liquidity. Um, just leave me in there until a coincidence of bonds appears. I'm not, you know, I'm not time sensitive. I have like stable coin, stable coin swap that, you know, I'm, I'm fine if it takes 24 hours to match. Um, but yeah, so, so, you know, the, I, I think, Technically, just uh, speeding up both the expectations on the solver side. So, you know, some of the solvers run algorithms that don't really run well in, in you know, less than, let's say, five seconds or less than a second even. Although clearly it's possible looking at um, builder and searcher algorithms to solve this problem in sub-seconds. Um, uh, it's just like, yeah, some, some, something that hasn't been quite prioritized yet. Um, but yeah, we hope to get there soon. So I saw you tweet a couple days ago that you think a lot of MEV problems can be solved at the application layer. Can you kind of peel that back an extra layer and explain why and maybe dive a little bit into uh, MEV blocker? When we look at kind of the most commonly talked about solution to MEV, um, I think, you know, coming from that, that, which is coming from Flashbots and, you know, the team has done tremendous work on illuminating people and educating people about the problem, foreseeing the negative externalities and, and building tools to you know, at least for the external, external negative externalities, circumvent those. Um, I think you know what what this did to the extraction itself was probably um, you know, bad for the user, but you know, at least for the network, it it it, it did um, reduce the, the 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 other problems we would otherwise have. Um, but but basically, their focus is on building an extra communication channel between the user, the basically person owning the transaction or owning the um, ultimately with swap and maybe also the intent and the um, validator that is actually responsible for creating the block and having a richer expression language for like you know what what the optimal block looks like rather than just this priority uh, first price gas auction that, that that we used to have um but then if you think about where mev actually comes from where it stems from i think it, it really uh, stems from the application layer and and i don't you know want to be judgmental towards towards the the uniswap mechanism but um you know at, at gnosis back in the day when we were looking into um, prediction markets uh, we were also thinking about you know modeling uh, markets between different outcome tokens via um, constant product formula and one of the things we saw was that uh, well okay if you have um this mechanism and there's multiple trades happening in the same block then the ordering of those trades matters and as the the validator you have the ultimate control over this ordering and so you can take advantage of, 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 of the trades and, and manipulate prices. And so for us, it was like, well, you know, this is not a mechanism that will be long-term sustainable. And so then Gnosis went into Dutch auctions and later on batch auctions, which is where Cow Protocol um, uh, came out of. But, you know, I, I, Uniswap is a great invention and solved a lot of problems, but basically that mechanism in itself is flawed and that, that DAP is creating the MEV. And we think that, you know, by just having a single price per token per block and building an exchange that enforces you know, at least for your exchange, there's only one price per token per block, you can reduce a ton of MEV. Um, the other type of MEV that's that's currently very much um, discussed is, is LVR, loss versus rebalancing, basically liquidity providers that are um, trading at stale prices and, and getting run over by ARP bots that are just um, equilibrating the, the prices they see on Binance and, and therefore in, you know, causing a loss at least versus um, if, if that liquidity provider was to implement the strategy kind of off-chain themselves, uh, can also be solved by you know having one price per token per block if we can get the amms to trade as part of the batch and have them accrue surplus just like user trades do 
there will just be a single equilibrium price per token and that equilibrium price will be what the new current you know the up-to-date uh, binance price is, and not what the binance price was 12 seconds ago um the other main source for mev i think is liquidations when uh, you know some collateralized debt position runs um, underwater then it needs to be liquidated that in and of itself is also can be modeled as a stop loss order um you know of course, you need then a reliable either Oracle or like understanding of what the current price is. But you know, assuming 90% of all DEX trading volume would be uh, handled through a batch auction that settles with a uniform price clearing, then that uniform clearing price could also signal that a loan is underwater, needs to be um, liquidated and therefore becomes liquidatable in that same batch. Uh, and so you know, LVR, liquid, um, uh, liquidations and, and swap MEV for me can all be solved with um, with this this type of mechanism and if we look then at what's left there i think you know there's of course still still a bunch of other uh, sources of mev but really uh, most of them uh, i think can be can be can be solved by rethinking the mechanism and 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 building a, a dap that is not exposing this kind of um, extractable value and then the question is what do we really need to solve at the infrastructure layer right why do we need this extra communication channel if it's really just for i guess you know front running a hack or some other you know very um exotic uh, types of of uh, I want to give a quick shout out to Hexens. As we explore today's blockchain landscape, let's take a moment to recognize them as a premier cybersecurity provider in Web3. Hexens is trusted by tier one projects like Polygon, including a security review on their new Polygon ZK EVM, Mantle, Risk Zero, Lido, One Inch, New Bank, and more. Get a deep dive into your technology stack with the most comprehensive analysis and cybersecurity consulting. Hexens not only uses widely known methodologies and flows, but discovers and introduces new ones on a day to day basis. With over $55 billion secured, they cover everything from smart contracts to blockchain to Web2 pen tests. Yeah, there's been nearly $7 billion of total value hacked in crypto's nascent history, so it's safe to say your team has a lot on the line. Don't skimp out, take your security seriously, and reach out to Hexens. Don't forget to mention 0x Research for a free Web2 pen test with your partnership, and reach out to Hexens at hexens.io. Find them in the links in the show notes or reach out to them at Permissionless. They'll be at booth 832. Uh, but without further ado, let's get back to today's episode. Okay. And one of the things you mentioned there was sort of that core principle of one price per token per block. And can you, I know you guys recently put, put out a research paper on this. So I'm, I'm curious, like what were the key findings? Like, is it truly possible to build that AMM that has this as a core principle? And like, why exactly does that uh, reduce the LVR experience by LPs? Like, I'm not sure I'm, I'm following there. Yeah, uh, of course. Yes, yeah. sorry. Um, let me try to back up a little bit. Um, so the the reason that LVR um, basically is created or, or, or you know, comes comes into play is that um, we only get a new Ethereum block every twelve seconds, and so at the end of each block, once the last transaction is is included, we can assume that right now the state of all the AMMs on Ethereum is perfectly in equilibrium with the outside state of the world. Right? Like if the price of Ether is 1900 on Binance, then the price of Ether will be 1900 plus minus LP fees and gas costs. But you know, let's assume no friction will be pretty much 1900 on Ethereum as well. But then 12 seconds pass. And in those 12 seconds, a lot can happen in the real world. So maybe the price of Binance goes up to 1905. because um, there's some big news incorporated? Or even if it just goes up by 1%, that might already be um, significant and create an arbitrage opportunity on chain. And now, all those LPs are still, the next block gets mined, and all those LPs are still stuck at the old price at 1900. Um, and so me as a block builder, as a validator, whoever has control over the first transaction that gets included in the next block is actually able to access that liquidity at the old outdated stale price and move it to the new, you know, let's say Binance, um, uh, yeah, Bi Binance authored uh, fair um, price of Ether. And so if the price moves from 1900 to 1910, let's say, my uh, the average price that I pay as an arbitrageur uh, roughly is 1995 um, on, on a Uniswap uh, AMM. So I'm making, um, compared to Binance, I make a $5 profit. And of course, in order to get that uh, first slot, I need to probably uh, pay 99%, if not more, of my profit to the validator to actually give me that slot, um, the first the first. Uh, the first uh, slot in the in, in the block. Um, but yeah, long story short is that the the LP basically traded at 1905, although it was pretty clear that the fair price was 1910. So the LP lost five dollars, 
uh, the arbitrageur made like pennies and the validator got a lot of money because it was able to auction off the first slot um, profitably. Now, if we assume that every token just has one price um, per block and that price reflects the entire or at least you know majority of the on-chain demand and supply for that token in that block, we could build an AMM that doesn't trade at the average price uh, or according to its uh, x times y equals k curve, but instead also trades at the uniform clearing price. And so if the batch auction decides that the fair price in our new block was 1910, then the AMM would also um, only be willing to trade at, um, at 1910. And so even in the complete absence of any other traders, an arbitrageur would then be able to go in and say, you know, okay, I want to trade against this AMM. And, and so basically the AMM is willing to trade anywhere between 1900 and 1910. But the way that um, you decide who gets to trade against the AMM is not by who comes first, but by who creates the highest improvement, price improvement over the, the, uh, the, the minimum price the, the, the AMM is willing to accept 1900 or then on average it would be 1900.05, um, of course. But basically if an arbitrator comes in and says, I want to trade against the AMM at 19.6, that's fine, they can do it. But another arbitrager can come in and say, I want to trade at 19.7. That's fine. They get priority because, you know, in, in Cal Protocol, we don't prioritize by who gets first, but by who does the most price improvement. And so, again, in equilibrium, arbitragers will bid themselves up maybe to 19.09 and 99 cents. But the difference being the arbitrager still makes one cent. Nothing changed there. The difference being that now no longer the validator gets the $4.99 of bribe, but instead that price improvement is forwarded to the liquidity provider, um, the passive AMM that before was being value extracted. So, you know, again, we have this shift from value from the validators, whose job is just to secure the chain and, and propose blocks to the actual, you know, true, and, and at least in our minds, true um, beneficiary of that value. For swaps, it's the user. Um, for liquidity provision, it's the, um, the LP provider. And that, that yeah, that kind of is the, the core idea of um, building cow native AMMs into the batch auction. That was an excellent description. I really appreciate the depth there. And so if this seems, this to me seems like a, a very, very intriguing solution. Uh, my question is, how does the, how is the AMM price aware of the auction? Like what is the connection between uh, the AMMs, like, like the input that actually goes into the formula there and like how the auction, like, uh, I guess, pushes that message to the AMM? Yeah. So you, you model the AMM basically just like another cow swap user or trader that has a limit order, but it's not a, a step function limit order. It's basically an X times Y equals K curved limit order. So the AMM says I'm willing to buy, you know, at my current price is uh, 1900. And for every amount, I can tell you what price I'm willing, you know, how much for every amount out I'm, uh, I, I tell you how much in I, I want to receive. So, so basically I, I can follow, I can model my curve as a, as basically a, uh, a convex limit order in a way, like not a step function. I want to trade 100 for you know, five, but it's more like if you give me this, I give you that. And so this is what the AMM gets modeled into the system. And then it just enters into the batch as a regular participant where solvers are maximizing price improvement. And so sure, I can match them at their limit price. But as long as there's one honest solver that's trying to improve the price, they will have an advantage over uh, the remaining solvers. And so in, you know, in equilibrium, um, we end up, shifting that arbitrage value that is currently bid for um, the first slot to price improvement that gets distributed to the um, AMM. Okay, now this is getting even more interesting. So I'm curious if you guys have built this in like a test environment or if this is something we can expect to see a, a launch later, you know, sometime next year. Yeah, so we are a small team and, and you know, we already talked about one batch per block and, and you know, kind of the, the resource constraints that we have and, and the technical that we have on, on that front. So it's something that we're extremely excited about. Um, we are, we've published a research paper, we've run some back tests. We, you know, would like to, um, uh, yeah, look further into this and, and, and build it out. Uh, I think we're um, currently talking to, um, at least one team more closely and um, to maybe to maybe help building this out i think you know building an amm there's a lot more to it than than just inventing the, the the mechanism i think we can provide the batch part we can provide the contact solvers and also um talk you know have an idea of how to solve the the mathematical problem in in, in some sense and give guidance there but really building a proper amm product with deposits and you know um, withdrawals and you know, all the experience that goes into that is at least right now, something that we're still um, looking for some help for. But yeah, I mean, we are quite 
I, I, yeah, we, we think this is a this is a promising idea and and um, basically looking to to make it a reality. But um, yeah, I can't commit to it uh, right now. Yeah, you can't do everything yourself in crypto. You'd get spread incredibly thin if you tried. But that's super exciting. I did want to switch gears a little bit and just get your take on Uniswap X. I mean, you guys have been working on similar things for quite some time, and I feel like you guys got some positive, you know, confirmation uh, with you know their V four strategy. I, I first and foremost think it's 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 great validation and and something that we've been um, yeah talking for I think two years about that you know users should not send raw transactions to the public mempool. That is something that is too complicated for the average user to to manage and deal with. Users should send trade intents, and then we should have professional entities that compete for fulfilling those intents and uh, find the best execution for users. Um, and seeing both one engine Uniswap enter that game, I think is is a huge validation and a sign how um, you know how how good of an uh, also you know innovation uh, department we, we have and, and now I think it's it's uh, uh, up to us to, to keep pushing the envelope and keep keep innovating. I think uh, the user experience is very similar. Um, of course you don't have the, the move sound if you trade on Uniswap. Um, but you're signing a message and you know you have like some mechanism that um, you know at least in in theory guarantees you pretty good execution um, i think where the two mechanisms then uh, differ a lot is that uh, uniswap access dutch order um, approach is i think quite good for mitigating mev for every individual order in that it basically makes your slippage tolerance adaptable over time um, so the the problem, like where most of the at least sandwiching or swap MEV comes from, is that you know I, Ethereum is is asynchronous, so t prices might change between the time that I uh, send a transaction out and the transaction getting mined. So you know either I want my transaction to fail or I say I'm okay with some price change. But um, you know usually I have to say upfront I'm okay with X percent price change, and then you know what will magically happen thanks to MEV is that full X percent will be exhausted. And so Uniswap X now said, okay, instead of defining a full X percent slippage tolerance, you know, from day from from zero seconds onwards, um, let's have an incremental slippage tolerance. So you start with a price that's maybe you know at what you would expect, or even slightly above what you would expect, and then that price decays over time down to your maximum slippage tolerance. And so as soon as some uh, are they called filler or some solver or some some searcher is able to actually give you that price you know maybe pocketing a little bit of of uh, of value on their end they have an incentive to go ahead and and fill your order rather than waiting everyone would have to collude to basically wait for your maximum slippage tolerance to be reached and then being able to extract you so it's it's a it's a nice mechanism to to protect each and individual's users slippage tolerance the the problem with the mechanism is that it has um, very limited upside in that even if the price changes between blocks and you know becomes more favorable for you there's no incentive for the filler to pass any of that price improvement on to the user so um, assume you know your current uh, dutch dutch order price is 1902 and in the next block it will be 1901 and the price on binance goes from 1900 to 1910 then in the next block, a filler will come and, and fill you, but they will fill you at 1901, even though the fair price uh, would have been 1910. In CowSwap, we have this mechanism where if some solver was willing to give you 1908, 1989, or even 1910, they would have won and have this incentive to, to improve the price for you. In Uniswap X, there's then still this race. Whoever gets in first, whoever bribes the validator the most to uh, match you at 1901 uh, will get the right to do so. Um, so you have limited upside and then um, due to the lack of batching or even I think the, the protocol theoretically would allow a filler to, to settle two orders um, in the same transaction if I, if I read the contracts correctly. But um, due to just the fact that every order is on their individual price curve, you don't have this concept of uniform price clearing. You don't have this uh, concept of you know, matching people directly um, peer to peer and aggregating demand and supply. And so in a hyper tokenized world with fragmented liquidity, um, I think we will see batch auctions, um, you know, play out uh, another advantage over this mechanism. And yeah, it's basically now up to us to to, to demonstrate and show how, you know, for example, with AMMs, maybe liquidations, really that concept of having one price per token per block um, gives significantly more MEV protection than um, 
than just individual Dutch 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 orders um, per trade. I want to get your take here on a slightly different question on the same topic. And, you know, when it comes to these order flow auctions, what matters more? Is it the underlying tech or is it the protocol branding? Because, you know, for example, I think uh, one inch has a lot less robust of a uh, OFA than, than CalSwap, yet it does see a significant amount of volume. So I'm, I'm curious, like, how do you think about the trade off there between the tech and the branding itself? Yeah, I mean, I'm a I'm a technologist. I I'm I'm probably overly naive, overthinking. Uh, if you build a better mechanism, they will come. The last uh, the last two and a half years uh, taught us otherwise. Like uh, it's not just enough to uh, to have a better mechanism or to you know even have a good mechanism. Uh, you know, people were coming to Gaussop, but if you you know at conferences when we talk to people, they they say like you know the, the most differentiating factor is the moo sound and and that it, that that the UI looks super cool and yeah, that's the market. The market tells you what. What, what the market wants um but uh yeah so branding um having that direct contact with the end user i think is, is extremely um important for a product to be successful i think also the first mover advantage we noticed that with meth blocker quite significantly if you're the first product in the space you have um, a, a certain advantage and then even if you change your mechanism later on to to adopt the mechanism that you see somewhere else that that might be working better um, you uh, then have kind of that user base that is loyal to your brand, loyal to your product. And, and um, I think at CowSwap, we still have to do a better job at really highlighting what are the key differentiating factors and why users should care and why they matter. Um, but given the state of crypto right now, branding um, and convenience uh, is, is definitely quite important. Um, but my hope is, you know, in the long run, if we want crypto to grow another 10 or 100x, um, the the better the better tech will win i uh, i tend to think that 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 last statement there is, is quite correct and we i think we over index on the importance of today's branding in our industry given how nascent it is and it's like okay well if we 100x the amount of people that come into this space uh are they all still going to go hit the uniswap front end like it's like i would tend to think not and that these like better solutions that now exist uh kind of tend to capture some of that flow um but yeah it'll be interesting to see how that that dynamic kind of sp spins out um, but one of the other things uh, kind of, you know, in the same realm that I wanted to hit on uh, was just like the idea of the post swap hooks that or the cow hooks that, that you guys have um, created. That's kind of gives the ability to do more than just swaps and is like, what's next on the roadmap? Is it just to get continued building in that direction? Yeah. So for cow hooks, this was actually one one feature that we launched without a clear like it's a protocol feature. We launched without a very clear vision of what will be the first user facing product uh, to incorporate it. And the idea really was that, well, right now, the intents that users um, express when they trade on CowSwap is a, a swap a limit order. But what if your what if we can upgrade that intent expression language to do X, then swap, then do Y? So really having like a pre hook or a pre interaction, then have your swap and then have a, a post hook and a post interaction. And then just some ideas that we are looking into is, um, well, as, as a pre interaction, you could, for example, uh, set in, set, set a, a gasless approval. So for, um, permittable tokens, you, you could just in time, um, basically then mine the, the, the approval before, just before you trade, you could unstake a token. And I think there are some tokens where. You first need you cannot really swap the staked version of it you first need to unstake it but then you can swap the unstaked version and restake immediately so you know theoretically you could just unstake swap restake in in a, in a single transaction and then then never have to um you know do those do those steps uh, separately and i think bridging to another chain is also a very common thing that people do after a swap um, so theoretically what these hooks allow you to do is say okay i want to trade on uh, mainnet but i want to have my proceeds on gnosis chain or in polygon or some other L2, and then um, you'll swap and bridge um, kind of atomically in, in in the same transaction. And the nice thing is that you only pay gas again. Um, you only pay for that that interaction once your trade goes through. Uh, you don't have to worry about um, failed transactions or, or even managing gas. Like you, you don't pay an ETH, you pay in the sell token that that you're swapping with. Um, so you know if if you have a new address and you, for example, um, get allocated a token uh, airdrop, or you know maybe you have an old address that you already wiped, and then you get like some retroactive airdrop there, uh, you can, you know, in in theory now claim, approve, swap, and uh, bridge the proceeds somewhere else uh, in one atomic intent uh, without needing to have any ETH on that on that on that account. 
Um, so yeah, that's on the protocol side, kind of what is possible with it. Um, on the CalSwap UI side, I think things we will see quite um, soonish is yeah, the option to, to gaslessly approve tokens. And um, I think we're also experimenting with some uh, bridging uh, solutions. So maybe we'll see a, a way of, of, of bridging proceeds to another chain kind of as part of the UI. Um, but yeah, we also have a grants program. So for any ideas, can anybody whether wants to build on top of the protocol, maybe on the AMM side, maybe on the hook side, we are definitely um, yeah, sponsoring teams, individuals, projects that they want to build on top of CowSwap. And, and really, I think for hooks specifically, the, um, the possibilities are endless. And there's a lot of really cool things you can build with it. Nice. Yeah, that's a good call out too. We'll be sure to link to that in the show notes. We'll get it from you after the after the call. But I did want to get your take too on just um, the DAO to DAO side of using CowSwap. I know you guys have had some success there. So I was hoping you could shed some light and maybe some of the other use cases that you thought of. Yeah, so for DAOs specifically, um, you know, one thing that, that DAOs have, have uh, trouble with is that coupling of here's a trade I want to do. And now and then, you know, sometime later, I'm going to do that trade. Um, so, so I mean, if you, if you look at most DAOs, they, they have, uh, they, they create a proposal. Hi, okay, we want to diversify our treasury. We want to do this trade. And then there's a discussion on the, on, the, on the proposal. And then, yeah, maybe somebody proposes a transaction, a concrete transaction. So they might go to, I don't know, one inch and say like, okay, you know, what's the best way to convert ETH into a, a staked Ether right now, or, you know, some stable coin for diversification. And you know, then there's a route. Okay, cool. Let's use that route. And then they propose that transaction and have the DAO vote on it. And depending on the DAO voting periods, might last from a day to a week. Um, and so the price, and probably also you know, for sure the route, and and very likely also the price will have changed. And 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 so the DAO is really in a in a, in a difficult situation that they can't really set. You know, what what what, what slippage tolerance are they going to set? Um, what will be the price of of ether, for example, in a week from now? Nobody really knows. And if you said. 10% slippage tolerance and the price goes you know, 5% in your favor, you can be sure that some MEV bot will, will eat the entire 15% um, away from you. So really like this, this intent expression paradigm that we introduced, we thought is particularly powerful where, this, where there's this disconnect between having the intent and executing the intent. Um, so another use case for that is multi-signature wallets. If you have a safe or um, some, other, um, some other smart contract wallet with multiple signers, you know, you might be sitting, even if it's if, if it's your phone and your laptop, you know, it might take you a couple of minutes to, to go from your phone to your laptop. Or, you know, if you're in a team setup, it might take a couple of um, minutes or even hours for your other signers to wake up and, and sign that transaction. You know, the, the, the optimal route between you proposing the transaction and then the transaction ending up on chain is huge and, and things change in that time. So it's much more powerful to just um, set an intent, um, basically say, I want to trade that token for that other token, have a... Um, uh, reasonable guarantee that you get best price execution. So this mechanism that that improves um, basically tries to get as much surplus for you as possible. So you can set a, a slippage tolerance that is actually um, reasonable. For DAO specifically, we even had a, a grant proposal that introduced another module which can do a just-in-time oracle check. So um, if, if you really want to uh, make a trade in, in a week in the future and you're not comfortable setting a 20-30% slippage tolerance, um, there is a technical solution to that as well called Milkman. Um, but yeah, basically this, this, the asynchronousity of somebody wanting to make a trade and the trade actually happening is where CowSwap's um, intent mechanism really comes uh, uh, to play. And I know I, on that same note, I know Curve and Yearn both use CowSwap for like processing their harvests and fee collections. Is that something that they do through MEV blocker, the RPC endpoint? No, so the, um, I think Yearn um, pioneered it on, um, on, on, on Cow Protocol. Um, yeah, basically, uh, and Curve is now following suit. Um, yeah, basically, protocols can pretty permissionlessly place these types of orders that, uh, and, and especially if the amounts are, are relatively small, there is um, you know, off-chain bonds that, that solvers are, are posting in order to make sure that they're not um, misbehaving. Uh, and so, so yeah, we have like some, some other soft guarantees on, on best price execution, which we sometimes referred to as EBBO, so the, you know, whatever is the best um, price that can be seen um, on, on Ethereum's public uh, liquidity. So looking at balance or looking at SushiSwap, Uniswap, and Curve, although Curve, I think, right now is not part of the EBBO um, store definition. Solvers are not allowed to, to match you at a price that's worse than that. Um, and so what these, what these, these um, 
DAOs can do is really like post limit orders and say, okay, I just want to sell this token um, and just give me whatever the best price is for it. And, and it really allows you to automate um, the the fee harvesting process and 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 make it completely permissionless in in that um, you know anyone can trigger uh, the harvest. It will create an order on CowSwap, um, and then there's like this this you know, smart order type, which you know, might might be uh, going a little bit more too far here, but um, you know, we we. Uh, we allow like a smart contract. This goes a little bit back into the AMM discussion we had earlier. Um, so smart contracts can place regular limit orders, just like A for B at this price. But theoretically, smart contracts can also place um, arbitrary complex expressions of, um, you know, I always want to have 50% of my balance in that token and 50% of my balance in that token. Um, and then uh, solvers that know about this smart contract can basically use um, ERC 1271, so smart contract signature verification to then um, issue trades on behalf of that smart contract. Uh, so if it sees that a smart contract is basically imbalanced, a solver can say, oh, I know that the smart contract would like to trade and basically initiate the rebalance or re initiate the, the, the fee harvest uh, on behalf, of, um, on behalf of, of that smart contract. And so you can really build completely autonomous trading agents, which run um, without any input from um, external bots or, or you know, what in the past you might have used um, searches for and put like some MEV bounty on it. If you trigger this transaction, then you know I'll pay you some 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 uh, some reward, and then some MEV bot will, will pick it up. Um, but basically, with CowSwap, you can um, both benefit from you know best price execution as well as having this competition on what is the least amount of bribe I need to pay to. Um, yeah, to get this trade through and and therefore you know, have uh, fully autonomous systems at the at the best possible price. That's incredible. Yeah, I, I loved your your viewpoints there as well. And so it, it's cool to see that doubt to doubt relationship. You know, I think we should hopeful be hopeful that that continues to to grow out into the future. Um, yeah, no, that that's great to see. And so when it comes to Maybe a, a bit more of a, a random question here, but there was a recent governance proposal, uh, CIP 28, to move 450 ETH to the so the uh, Cal Treasury core unit to earn yield. Um, what are your thoughts around Treasury management as a DAO and like how you have to you know manage that as um, to keep the the continuation of the protocol going? So right now we are partnering with Kapatki, um, who is also a uh, NOSA spinoff for uh, Treasury management, and I think uh, this works well for active Treasury management. So um, when you know basically you're chasing you're chasing yields, uh, you you know the, the Kapatki team is extremely um, reliable, professional, and 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 technically um, knowledgeable. So it's really um, you know it's, it's it's an absolute pleasure to work with them. Um, uh, long term, I think there's certain DAO treasury operations that I would like to see more increasingly moving into these kind of autonomous um, smart orders, uh, as, as, as we'd like to call them. So not your active treasury management where you're chasing the, the, the most safe and yet uh, profitable yield. I think those you know, will, will also you know, still be used by or executed by, by professional treasury management uh, companies. But um, if, you, if you want to have a certain diversification between different stable coins or different liquid staking token derivatives, then you can express those as, as smart orders and, and basically have our protocol take care of that rebalancing for you. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think right now we're still more in the kind of active phase and, and you know, want to make sure that we uh, generate as much revenue as possible also from the, uh, from the treasury. But um, I would assume us to also pioneer and, and, um, build some proof of concepts on how a completely passive autonomous um, treasury management solution could look like. Yeah, we are certainly in the early innings of of DAOs. That's, that's for sure. Just go on any forum and you can see it pretty easily. But uh, Felix, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thanks so much for for joining us. Do you want to share with the, the people who are where where they can find you to learn more about CowSwap and, you know, Cow Protocol in general? Yeah, so... Um, I mean, cow.fi is our is our landing page. Swap.cow.fi is uh, is the user interface that uh, is mostly used for for connecting to Cow Protocol. It's the one that has the happy moo um, at the end of your trade. And um, yeah, I mean, we are on. We have a big Discord community. We're quite active as well. I myself, um, uh, F. Leupold at uh, at Twitter on Twitter, and uh, we have uh, at CowSwap and at MethBlocker on Twitter as well. And yeah, we're also going to a lot of Ethereum conferences, hackathons. So. Um, yeah, always happy to to connect to to the community and and also to builders and and convince people to you know, 
build more on on batch auctions with uniform price clearing. Yeah, you guys are building some great things as well. So uh, yeah, if, if there's a builder out there, I hope we can connect someone to you because I want to see a, a lot of these things in production. So we'll be sure to include that link in the show notes as long as the other links you mentioned. But thanks again, Felix. This is a great discussion.